So the first thing that I want to talk about, of course, is, is why would you want to do this? What's the, what's the motivation for doing this? So um, for starters, uh, what we actually wind up seeing in uh, real world production cases is that you can actually get greater capacity through pooling and over subscription. This isn't really a new idea, um, but, the, but the idea here is to take advantage of the sum of uh, hardware, resource budgets, things like that. Um, and in a lot of cases, uh, what you find is that not all tenants or users of the cluster are active at the same time or at all times. So uh, for instance, if you have a, a group that's doing uh, automated data processing, like running jobs every uh, 30 minutes or hour uh, to do data ingestion or, or uh, cleansing, and you have ad hoc users there's usually a place within those ETL jobs uh, where the cluster is sitting idle. So you wind up getting better utilization by uh, being able to pile extra users onto the same cluster or, or grid um, to be able to take advantage of those lulls in activity. Um, so silo clusters or clusters where you have uh, smaller numbers of clusters that are used by individual groups within an organization. Um, tend to sit idle often uh, for, a lot of, uh, for a lot of those use cases. Um, being able to combine people onto shared infrastructure uh, greatly reduces management overhead. Uh, you have slightly different management concerns. Um, I'm actually going to get into what some of those are, um, but suffice it to say that it's easier to manage uh, a group of people on one large shared uh, piece of inf infrastructure than it is on 10 or 20 individual 10 node clusters scattered throughout an organization. Um, and of course, it's less expensive. Uh, and the reason why is uh, the shared services that go into supporting a Hadoop cluster like the networking infrastructure, um, bastion hosts, monitoring infrastructure and licenses, things like that. Um, are, are reduced uh, when you have a, a single large cluster. Um, it's important to remember that when we talk about Hadoop and we talk about commodity hardware and sort of cheap, um, it's important to remember that even cheap can still be expensive. Um, when you start looking at 50 machines or 100 machines or 1,000 machines, you know, and you do the math out at $5,000 a machine given like a reasonable amount of storage, plus the switching costs and the power costs and all that kind of stuff, it ultimately leads to unhappy uh, uh, sysadmins and, and unhappy uh, uh, CFOs. Um, with that, I want to talk about some reasons why you would not look at uh, rolling a number of siloed clusters together. Um, and these should be pretty obvious uh, what the motivation here is, but I, I want to call them out explicitly. So cases where you have real security concerns. I don't mean like we have a policy that these people can't see that data, but if it happened, it's not really a big deal. I'm talking about real security concerns. Social security numbers, credit card numbers, um, uh, you know, anything that puts you in sort of PCI territory, HIPAA compliance, things like that. Um, this could be a real problem. Um, the alternative is don't store this data in Hadoop. Um, it's rare, I think, that you would need to do sort of machine learning or, or, or you know, uh, data mining on credit card numbers. It's much more common that you use uh, less sensitive pieces of uh, uh, information. Uh, the other reason, of course, is, is dramatically different uh, performance profiles of various services. Um, and sometimes I just call this the HBase rule. Um, and, and really what I'm getting into here is, you know, HBase wants to do a lot of random I.O. It wants, uh, you know, it's a little bit more CPU hungry than, than some MapReduce jobs and things like that. Um, it has latency uh, sensitivities that MapReduce jobs don't have. Um, Again, just reasons why you may not combine uh, certain workloads. Um, also, you may have hardware optimized for a specific use case. 
Um, there may be cases where you have extremely memory hungry processes or you need 10 gig ethernet rather than one gig ethernet you know, for, for uh, network intense operations. Um, drastically different availability profiles. So uh, you have to remember that moving everybody onto shared infrastructure uh, basically means that all people now on this cluster or all tenants or customers, whatever you want to call them, are affected by maintenance processes and things like that. Uh, this can be sort of one of those hidden things that you don't realize until it after, after it happens, but you know, at that point, maintenance is going to impact everybody rather than just some subset of the company. So we've seen this case where uh, customers of Cloudera, where we've helped them you know, take like a research cluster and move it to production and then put like ETL jobs on that cluster. And then the research guys kind of go, we want to upgrade HBase. And they just start shutting stuff down, right? You can't do those kinds of things. So you have to think about how the SLA changes based on which customers you onboard onto the shared infrastructure. So if you're onboarding low latency people, they care about certain things, they have different SLAs than your, than your batch uh, back office uh, operations. Um, so let's say you get past all of this and you pile on a bunch of different business units within a larger organization onto a shared uh, Hadoop cluster. What could possibly go wrong? Um, so it turns out a few things. Um, resource contention is probably a number one, and that's sort of a broad category. By resource contention, I mean processing contention, and in the case of Hadoop, this is almost always slot contention, um, where different tasks within a MapReduce job want different you know, machines for data locality, want different data sets. Um, you start actually getting some fighting in the scheduler for uh, what tasks run where. Uh, obviously, storage contention is easy to envision. Um, anybody who's ever shared like, uh, like a NAS or a SAN has sort of that horror story where somebody wakes up and dumps like some data set in a temp directory that happens to live on the same partition as Oracle's you know, data files or something like that, and next thing you know, Oracle's shutting down. Um, you sort of have the same problem here, except we're talking about HBase, uh, sorry, uh, HDFS capacity um, in terms of storage. But you also have to remember that you have local capacity to worry about as well. Uh, in the relational database world, this is like your temp or spool space. But you do have this case where MapReduce jobs can uh, explode data, intermediate data between map and reduce phases gets written to local disk. Uh, that disk might be shared with HDFS. So what you actually see is this sort of pump effect of, you know, uh, disk usage while MapReduce jobs run. Um, something to be aware of, something to think about. Um, so you have both uh, HDFS and local disk capacity to worry about. Um, network bandwidth um, is also always in contention. The shuffle phase of MapReduce jobs uh, between the map phase and the reduce phase. Um, there's a ton of data moving around the network. Uh, hopefully you use things like compression to, to mitigate this. But in a lot of cases, this still hurts. Um, it's not uncommon for large MapReduce jobs during that shuffle phase to actually impact things like HBase performance, where low latency access is really important. Um, there are a number of switches um, by sort of you know what you would think of as high-end uh, networking manufacturers, where as the network load increases on the switch, packet latency starts to also increase. This is not an uncommon phenomenon once you start pushing switches to sort of their upper bounds. Um, so again, type of things that can go wrong. Um, security, of course, is an important one. Um, it's not unusual to talk to Hadoop users that are used to thinking in sort of siloed environments. They write a web application and or, or uh, a, a service or something like that, and they actually assume that all directories are writable by this user, or you know, they make all of these weird assumptions. And processes that are, are built in these single tenant or, or siloed environments tend to have a hard time transitioning from that to a multi-tenant environment. So 
if you know that your organization is moving to this sort of model where you have shared infrastructure and shared resources, you have to really think about, like, when my application writes temporary data, you know, between stages of ETL, is that data sensitive? Do I need to protect temporary directories? Do I need to uh, deal with those kinds of problems? Uh, in some cases, you do. Um, there's also, I think, uh, sort of uh, a more specific case of resource contention. There is a, a, a big problem with uh, potential shared service disruption. So you could look at the network as a shared service in this case. Um, but more commonly um, has been this problem of job tracker heap blowouts where people run a MapReduce job that turns out into like a million mappers or something like that and terrible things happen inside of the job tracker. Um, the, uh, some of the schedulers have, have dealt with this in different ways and I'm going to get to that in, in a slide or two. But um, uh, it's one way you can deal with it. Um, but you have to sort of just be cognizant that these things uh, wind up happening. Um, name node heap exhaustion. Again, this is a case where name node is storing all of its metadata, the HDFS metadata in RAM. You can have cases where people, uh, in a very short amount of time, create a ton of small files and exhaust you know, name node heap uh, availability. Um, File handle limits on the, at the OS level uh, also uh, can be a, uh, a fun and exciting problem to debug uh, when you run out of uh, file handles and things like that. Um, there are a ton of things that are also Hadoop specific, mostly in terms of uh, the schedulers and resource allocation and user limits um, that, can, that can go wrong here. Um, I'll talk about the, some of them in, in a minute. It's actually worth mentioning that if you attended uh, Arun's talk earlier today on uh, Next Gen MapReduce, or MR2, it goes by a few different names. Um, this is part of the reason, uh, the, the, the impetus behind it, is because you need to be able to deal with these weird cases where people can disrupt shared infrastructure. So things like MR2 are looking to uh, solve at least uh, some of these problems, uh, if not all of these problems, or at least on the MapReduce side. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, schedulers in Hadoop. Um, in Hadoop, the scheduler, the role of the scheduler um, is actually to decide which tasks from which jobs run in what order, and also uh, on which machines. There's, a, there's another component to that that I, that I didn't really cover. Um, they are pluggable inside of Hadoop, um, the, the scheduler that actually makes these uh, decisions. Um, by default, Hadoop comes with what's called the FIFO scheduler, the first in, first out scheduler. Um, it works sort of like you think it does. The first person to submit the job gets the resources, and those resources are occupied until that job finishes. Um, it will not cut it, absolutely, in a multi-tenant environment. Um, the simplest case, again, is where you have people running ad hoc jobs and uh, ETL processes that maybe need to run every hour. The simplest case is that uh, an ambitious researcher comes along and writes a hive query that results in um, a metric ton of mappers. It fills all slots on the cluster, and then the ETL job tries to run while it's running and gets no resources, and you blow the SLA. Um, so for an operations person, um, this, is, this is a bad situation. Um, and it's not really feasible to pay somebody to stare at the job tracker UI and kill jobs whenever resources are required. Um, so schedulers can, can uh, solve some of these problems. Um, you'll definitely want to use either the capacity scheduler or the fair scheduler. Um, both of them uh, have uh, similar feature sets. They go about things in slightly different ways. Um, both of them are trying to solve similar problems. So uh, both of them are designed for large multi-tenant environments. Um, both of them support the notion of multiple queues or pools. Uh, some of the nomenclature is, is different between them. Um, both of them have a notion of queue or pool-based access control lists, so who's allowed to submit jobs to a given uh, queue. 
excuse me. Um, they both support uh, features to allow minimum resource allocations per user uh, or uh, queue. So for instance, you might have a queue for production ETL jobs that's guaranteed to get 20 slots, 20 mapper slots and 13 reducer slots. So you might have an ad hoc uh, query job that is not guaranteed to get any resources. It'll get them if they're available, but otherwise it has to wait behind uh, production jobs. Um, the way you enforce SLAs in Hadoop is effectively um, using queues or, or pools with different minimum resource uh, assignment. So similar to you know, uh, Oracle's notion of resource groups and, and things like that, this is basically a way of saying that if there's an, a, a, a production job, it must get 80% of the cluster. Um, if there's no production job, let the ad hoc users get the whole thing. So it's really a matter of, and this is what I mean about oversubscription and sort of resource sharing and, and how pooled resources become sort of greater uh, overall. Um, and both of these schedulers support the notion of uh, queue or job or pool limits. So let's say user eSAMR is only allowed to run three MapReduce jobs at a time or something like that. Um, the feature sets, again, like I said, differ between the capacity scheduler and the fair scheduler. Both of them are, are available in Hadoop. They're in the uh, contrib directory when you download Apache Hadoop. Uh, they require just a tiny bit of extra configuration, but it's not uh, it's not uh, terribly difficult. Um, certainly the, the community can, can help you get up and running with those. Um, some people say like, well, do I need them in siloed environments? And the answer might also be yes. Like if you actually have a cluster that is only for a, a restricted set of people, it may still be, in fact, it's usually still uh, advantageous to go through the uh, effort of setting up the capacity or fair scheduler um, because of some of the, you still have this problem of what if I submit two MapReduce jobs, one right after the other, like which one runs first and how do they share resources? So in other words, scheduling within a pool or within a group, um, you, can, you can still make reasonable decisions there as well. Um, so large scale people um, use uh, different schedulers. Uh, the capacity scheduler, for instance, is seen um, uh, extensive use at, at Yahoo, um, and uh, they're the original authors, I think, of the capacity schedule. Don't quote me on that, I'm 99% sure. And I, I think that the Facebook scheduler, or the Facebook scheduler, the uh, FAIR scheduler originally was developed um, by a gentleman while he was doing an internship at Facebook. Um, and they're, last I heard, a, a big user of the FAIR scheduler. Again, don't quote me. Um, so uh, the notion of quotas, uh, being able to effectively share uh, storage space is really what I'm, what I'm talking about here. Um, HDFS supports both quotas based on uh, size as well as the number of files. And the latter one sounds a little bit strange. If it doesn't make sense, I promise you it will, will in a minute. Uh, size quotas effectively limit the amount of space that a user or, or a group uh, can consume. Um, file count quotas um, are a roundabout way of limiting name node memory consumption. Um, this is a side effect. So we know that every file in HDFS burns some RAM in the name node. So being able to restrict the number of files that a given user uh, can, can create uh, effectively limits how much RAM they can burn in the name node over a short period of time. Or, or over a period of time. Um, these are configurable per, uh, per directory. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, this is the primary means, again, of guaranteeing SLAs sort of on the storage side. 
um, on a shared environment or a multi-tenant environment. So uh, being able to share disk between ad hoc users again and automated users. And I keep going back to that example because it's really easy to understand. There are you know, shades of gray in between that. And, and uh, it might be that ad hoc users need to also be guaranteed some resources. I don't want to, anybody to think I'm picking on researchers. Um, but uh, I guess I am a little bit. Um, so uh, these are just some quick commands about how you would set um, how you would set these, uh, these uh, quotas. Um, authentication and authorization. So obviously authentication, the process of are you, are you who you say you are um, in Hadoop is largely based on Unix users and, and groups and primarily users. Um, uh, thanks to a lot of hard work at, at uh, Yahoo, they, they spent time de developing Kerberos support for uh, for Hadoop, um, which allows stronger uh, uh, auth uh, authentication uh, based, on, uh, based on Kerberos credentials. Um, also, enabling Kerberos uh, allows you to, uh, or effectively requires that you turn on uh, users for everybody across the entire cluster. So basically, you get user isolation uh, for uh, jobs. The, the individual tasks of a MapReduce job wind up running as the user who submitted them rather than user MapRed or Hadoop. Um, this is, again, critical for separation uh, between jobs. Um, author, on the authorization side, for data access in HDFS, we have Unix-like permissions. Nothing super exciting there, sort of tried and true, uh, with all the same caveats and, and all the same issues in a lot of ways as uh, Unix uh, permissions. Uh, for processing uh, resources, again, we're talking primarily about MapReduce queues. Um, you have, uh, or, or pools, you have access control lists based on uh, user and group. Um, there are higher level constructs starting to pop up in the Hadoop world. Notably, for instance, like Hive got this notion of uh, grants and roles at sort of the Hive object level, like a table or something like that. So, so the, the model is, is getting more and more high level and, and uh, uh, you know, with different levels of granularity. Um, it's worth noting that it's still useful uh, without um, strong authentication. Um, and this say, should say for some uses rather than some users. Um, it can be that there are cases where uh, strong authentication is sufficient. Um, you have to make that decision for how your uh, organization operates. Um, in advanced cases, you can actually write plugins to handle how uh, Hadoop maps uh, users to groups. So what do you do when things go wrong in multi-tenant environments? The short answer and the best answer I can possibly give you is to be very proactive. Um, catch it before it goes catastrophically wrong. Um, monitor health of the machines and the services. Monitor aggregate performance at the host level and also at the, um, at the service level. And um, enable name node uh, audit logging uh, to a separate file. Um, there are good docs on how to do that. Monitor job level performance. Uh, most of these catastrophic failures have early indicators. Uh, and that's sort of what I'm trying to drive home here, is that by monitoring, you can catch a lot of these problems before they really become a problem. And really, at the end of the day, you're just trying to identify, isolate, and diagnose problems. Um, you can create penalty queues if you're creative with the schedulers to move misbehaving jobs there. Blacklists in MapReduce tend to identify misbehaving nodes. Um, but it is important to remember that Hadoop has this notion of uh, retries and things like that. And it's not uncommon to actually not realize that nodes are failing and things like that. So make sure you monitor uh, proactively. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, all I have here, I think we have some time for quick questions. Um, if anybody has any, I'm happy to answer those. So uh, question about how, how do your customers uh, in your multi-tenant uh, situation uh, take backups of your data? That's a great question. <laughs> uh, how do people take backups? Um, 
Right now, there are a few different tools. There's uh, DCP, which will allow you to do distributed copies between clusters. Um, it's kind of hard to move that much data between data centers. I think at the end of the day, um, the easiest thing to do in a lot of cases is to actually build some sort of journal or write ahead log into the application side of things in a lot of cases and generate a change log, ship the change log between clusters as data is generated and reapply it. That's not always feasible. It tends to be today on a case by case basis, depending on the, the, the use case of the customer. Um, this is a place where I think Hadoop needs a lot of work. We need to find uh, good ways of doing backups, good ways of doing recovery. At the end of the day, you know, how do you back up 10 petabytes of data? You know, you need another cluster that can hold 10 petabytes of data. It's, I wish I had a better answer than that. Um, but it's really DCP or some sort of journal or dual ETL where incoming files come in, you ship them to two clusters and you run the same ETL process uh, and then validate the results that they're the, the, they're the same. So in terms of uh, name node memory management, uh, managing, have you employed any kind of time to live on files whereby they just sort of disappear yeah. as in a model with, uh, that HBase uses? Yeah, um, also really good, great question. Um, there's nothing in Hadoop proper that will do this for you, but it's not uncommon for ETL processes to you know, churn out these sort of temporary files all over the place. And in a lot of cases, you need some sort of pruning process. Um, generally, uh, and I've built it a few times on professional services time with customers, but you wind up basically building temp watch, but for HDFS, you know, you wake up every couple of minutes or something like that, and you have a list of directories and some time to live, and you just start removing files. Um, again, probably, uh, whether or not that's something that should be in Hadoop or a service around Hadoop, um, my feeling is that it should be the latter. No reason to complicate HDFS with that type of behavior, but um, yeah, I mean, that's the best advice I can give you is, is to come up with some sort of process like that. Thank you. Uh, in a multi-tenant environment, um, how do you recommend handling, you know, stack upgrades when you have multiple cust customers who may have a preference of having the upgrade, or the other customer may not have the preference, and both are quite important and, yeah. you know, like, critical. That is a really hard problem. Um, quite honestly, that should be in the list of slides, like, you know, that say when not to <laughs> uh, use uh, multi a multi-tenant cluster. I do think in certain ways MR2 and next-gen MapReduce will handle this because my understanding is that you can do, you can run slightly different versions of the MapReduce infrastructure. Um, I'm not, not an expert in, in MR2 just yet uh, or maybe ever, but you know, um, I, that's a, there's no good answer there other than run separate clusters for a, a more sort of rapidly moving like, uh, slightly unstable but more feature friendly cluster and a production maybe lags behind certain things. Um, that's a great question that I don't have a great answer to. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Um, we have time for maybe one more quick one. If not, we'll just sort of wrap it up. Yeah. Oh, hold on. <laughs> one quick one. Okay, so you mentioned how I can uh, put quotas on uh, the file system and on the compute capacity. Uh, is there uh, any way or anything planned to do that for a network, for instance? For? Network. Bandwidth? Oh, for the network. Um, you know, I've heard rumblings of people looking for that, like rate limiting during MapReduce jobs and things like that. There's no current effort, and again, like that might be a case where like MR2 might be able to tackle some of that, uh, transporting different uh, requirements in the infrastructure, uh, transporting that data down to the task tracker, but there's nothing that I'm aware of, uh, either in the pipe, currently in development. Um, I haven't seen any of that on the mailing list, but that would be a great, I mean, 
There's probably a Jira for it, but I, <laughs> but I don't know anybody working on it. 